Hello everyone and welcome to The Wild Side. That was Kendra Morris and I am Caitlin Kite, host of The Wild Side. And before I jump into today, I just want to read a little bit um, of a script that we have here that each of us is hopefully reading over the next couple of weeks because we want to get you guys excited about a crowdfunder campaign that we have here in November um, in order to try to get us sell ourselves a new transmitter. And we've been on air for five years and we've not had a single break during that time and we've just been awarded a new license extension to carry on for another five years again. So this is really the perfect time for us to kind of um, push through and try to get some funding from all of our listeners and all of those generous people out there in the audience to try to help us buy a new transmitter so that we can stay on air and have really good, reliable quality of our, um, of our programs and of our reporting. So if you are interested in helping us out, even just a little bit with maybe just five pounds or anything that you can give, go to crowdfunder.co.uk in order to make a donation to Source FM, and we definitely appreciate every single penny. Um, so that's it for me in terms of housekeeping. I do want to just get back to the show today. This is actually my first time live in the studio for a few weeks now because I started a new job that had a different um, schedule than my previous one, so this is the first time I've not had to pre-record my show, and it's very nice to be back. Let's hope I can remember how everything works. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, emerging infectious diseases in plants. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I had a program about human pregnancy, and I do still want to have the second part of that series that I kind of promised on air at the time, but I happen to be writing a freelance article right now about infectious diseases and plants and how this might affect conservation um, and management schemes. And so I thought actually because all this information is really fresh in my mind, it would be a really good time to jump in and talk about this right now and then get back to the pregnancy hopefully uh, next week. So emerging infectious diseases are diseases that are caused by pathogens that have one of several characteristics, or I should say one or more of several characteristics. The first is that they've increased in incidence or uh, in the geographical area over which they occur. They've changed their mode of pathogenesis, so there's something different about how they're impacting organisms. They have newly evolved, so they've just come into being from maybe something else that wasn't virulent at all. Or they've been um, discovered brand new, or they've newly been recognized as a problem. So they're emerging for one or more of these reasons. It's not like they uh, necessarily just popped into being, but we've just you know, we've just come across them, they've just hit our radar, they've just become a serious problem. So these are things that are often overlooked in plants, even though we do pay quite a lot of attention to them in humans and in animals. And that's because, uh, you know, humans, of course, we care about ourselves and we care about our livestock and our pets, and we care about all these charismatic animal species out in the wild. And plants are maybe not quite as charismatic because they don't, um, they aren't cuddly, I guess, and, and we don't know them quite as well as we know a lot of animals. But the thing is that even if you just think about agricultural plants, this is a really huge issue for us because obviously that has huge economic implications, that's how we feed ourselves. But also, wild plants are hugely important as well because of course they structure our habitats, they're a huge source of food and energy for uh, the plant life that we're interested in, they have a really important role in carbon sequestration, and so of course these things are just as deserving of attention and uh, of wild wildlife conservation responses as well. So it's a really good thing to think about these things in plants as well as these other species. Now, it's really hard to classify emerging infectious diseases, which I might also refer to as EIDs, just to have a little bit of a shortcut. And that's because there are so many. Um, they come from all different sorts of things, like fungi and bacteria and viruses and other organisms as well. We find them in different places, we find them in different types of plants. And one of the easiest ways to just kind of categorize them and break them down is to think about the sorts of things that they impact. And really there are three main categories. And the first is staple crops, and the second is kind of secondary crops, so things that aren't necessarily you know, fundamental to our diet, but things that we do still like and, and make money off of. And the third is going to be um, cash crops, oh sorry, that's the second, cash crops as well kind of fall into that category. And then the third will be wild plants, so those wild growing things that aren't necessarily important to us uh, economically, well at least not directly economically. So just I want to briefly go through each one of these and think about some examples and think about some ones that you might have heard of in the past just to kind of get you thinking about what are the implications of each of these kind of types of infection. 
So there are four main staple crops that are eaten around the world, and these are things like potatoes, rice, wheat, and corn. And so these are going to be the crops that are most impacted by EIDs. And so this is our first uh, major category, these staple crops. And because these things are so ubiquitous, they have a huge implication not only on our diet, but also on our finances, our health, even the whole ecosystem, because they do cover so much land out in the wild that um, you know, they have replaced a lot of other habitats, so that's where a lot of organisms now live. They link up other habitats and so kind of uh, have an implication for things that are moving through those habitats or from one little kind of patch of, of habitat to another. So they do have lots of different implications for wildlife and for the organisms around them. And two major examples of sta uh, staple crops that have been impacted are the potatoes from potato late blight and then also from, um, and also things like wheat and durum and rye that have been affected by the smut fungus. So I'll go through each one of these and just offer a few details because you probably have heard about these in the past. So of course the potato late blight, we all know of very well, people in Britain uh, and in the British Isles in general and people in the US are very familiar with this because of course it, it drove a huge migration of people from here to the US uh, in the 1840s or so, but that's actually not the first time that that disease had come about, and that's not the last time either. So people think that probably this uh, arose a really long time ago, somewhere in the range of kind of between the Andes and in Mexico. So potatoes originated in the Andes, that's where they were first domesticated, and you had people that migrated out from there up into Mexico, and somewhere along that route it seems that these potato plants picked up this uh, fungus-like eukaryotic microorganism known as an oomycete. And in particular, the oomycete Phytophthora infestans, which is, um, the Latin name for this means the plant destroyer. So these guys are really bad. They have maybe 100 or 500 different species in the entire genus of Phytophthora, and they're incredibly damaging to a huge range of organisms. And it turns out that this very specific one uh, was quite problematic for potato plants. So these things are quite um, closely related to brown algae and diatoms, and they tend to act either as saprophytes, which means that they kind of um, are feeding off of the, the innards of the plant, so they're kind of sucking out all the energy that the plants are trying to give to themselves, or they work directly as pathogens. And these guys are also sometimes called water molds. So what probably happened is that this Phytophthora species co-evolved with the wild potato, and it was fine, where it was in nature, it was kind of held in check by whatever, maybe the environment, maybe the natural defenses of the potato plant, but then once that plant was moved into a new habitat, it was grown in a different way, maybe there were some genes that emerged or, or uh, vanished, something happened to make this really problematic. And then basically each time that the potato was moved to a new country, to a naive host plant, this problem arose yet again. So it popped up in the U.S. in the 1840s, and that's uh, where it originally was when it was transplanted into Europe, and that's when the Irish potato famine happened. And that's just one of, of many instances where it has been a really big problem because it also has shown up in Asia and in Africa and then again in South America with each time that it was introduced. And you might think that it's quite strange for it to pop up in South America given that that's where it or originated, but actually it's done the same thing in the U.S. and Canada as well. And that's because you can have um, new strains evolving over time and therefore new problems that begin to emerge. And so as long as there's this kind of difference, this distinction and distance between the original plant and the original pathogen and what has changed and the new one that has evolved, then as soon as that one is imported, then it can cause problems all over again because it's basically acting as a whole new pathogen. And an example of this uh, happened in 1992 actually where there was a fungicide resistant strain that emerged and caused a whole range of problems even in areas where they had already dealt with the blight in the past. So that's a really good example that I think most of us are pretty familiar with. Another one that you may not have heard of um, quite so much or maybe not in so much detail is something called partial bunt and this affects as I said earlier wheat and durum and rye and it is caused by the smut fungus Telesia indica and this thing invades the kernels of these plants and starts eating out the bit that they have inside that they use for energy, the endosperm. And as it eats up this stuff, it then secretes some waste, and all of that waste just kind of builds up on the inside of the kernel, 
and it tastes bad and it smells bad and it generally makes wheat unpalatable. And in fact, because it does this, it reduces seed viability and also flower quality. So in crops where you've got a lot of this um, smut fungus invading, you end up harvesting everything and grinding the wheat, but then you can't actually use that wheat for human consumption. And you do get often the same amount of ultimate harvest, and so if you're not paying a whole lot of attention, you might not even have noticed that you were getting this kind of smut fungus invasion. So you get just as much product, but then when you grind it, you find out that actually the inside of those kernels were not edible, and so you're not able to do anything with all of this product that you have on hand. Now this first emerged in 1931, and it was found only at that time in South Asia and Iraq. So it was kind of in um, the near slash far east kind of location. But then, by 1972, it was found in Mexico, and by 1996, it was found in the U.S. And it actually has um, several modes through which it can spread, and this makes it quite a problem. So it can go through the soil, it can go through seeds, and it can go through the air, but it's predominantly introduced by the movement of the seeds themselves. So, unfortunately, these things can blow around, uh, they can be transported unwittingly by people, they can get stuck in machinery, and so machinery can move it if you are renting a machine, for example, to do your agricultural business. Then if someone else rents that later on and takes it to a new location, they can move the seeds with it. And the spores of these things are viable for several years after they have gone somewhere. So they might land in a plot that's not very good. Maybe there aren't any crops there right now, so there's nothing for it to invade. But they can just sit there and wait for you know six, seven years. And then suddenly the conditions become right, the spores are able to invade, and then completely decimate a crop. So you might go to an area thinking that's perfectly fine, and then find out that actually these things have been lying there waiting for you, and now everything that you've planted can't be used anymore. And actually this is such a problematic thing that this particular infection is regarded as a biological weapon because it can have such huge effects on the food supply and also on the economy of various countries that really have a lot of wheat growth um, and growth of these other plants as well. So now a lot of people are monitoring these exports very closely and some of these exports are actually banned in countries where the smut has been known to be a problem in the past because they want to make sure that pathogen is kept at bay and it isn't transported out either for just general um, fields that are out there that they don't want to get contaminated or also to people that might want to take it specifically and grow it up in large amounts so that they can introduce it on purpose as kind of a, an agricultural terrorism. Welcome back to the Wild Side. That was Tom Waits with Grapefruit Moon. And today we are talking about emerging plant diseases. And the next one that I wanted to talk about, the next general category of diseases, are those that affect things like uh, secondary staples and non-food crops and cash crops. So basically, all the kind of agricultural stuff that we have that's not an actual staple of our diets. So that's things like citrus fruits and bananas and coffee and cacao and and tobacco and all sorts of things like that. And these things are important because they generate income, they offer people a source of employment, they're quite good for export, and so they're good for a country uh, and not just a person. So kind of really important at all levels of the economy. And a really good example of, uh, of a disease that has affected one of these crops is the cassava mosaic disease which was found in Tanzania in 1894 originally, but then within a hundred years it had become a problem throughout the whole of Africa. And this is caused by a couple of different strains of viruses that are transmitted by white flies. And you'll probably notice if you listen to the whole show, there are a few different diseases that I'll talk about from now until the end that are transmitted by another organism. And so this is quite a problematic thing, where you not only have pathogens that can invade plants directly, but pathogens that are introduced by insects uh, and, and other species. And whenever you've got that kind of third player in there, that can make the process a lot more complex and can make it much more difficult to rein in. So in 1988, um, this cassava mosaic disease was particularly problematic in Uganda uh, and then also in Central and Eastern Asia because there was an extremely virulent variant that arose. And this led to widespread famine and actually the famine was so strong and so intense that it required international invention, in intervention sorry, in order to try to put people back on track and give them the food that they needed and kind of restore the economy of these countries. 
And that's just an example of how um, these plant diseases can have such a huge and widespread impact. They aren't just something that affects these things out in the field. They do have a, an immediate response. Um, they do have an immediate effect, sorry, on the rest of us, whether it's the people that are sitting there eat, trying to eat food and trying to grow crops and have an income, or whether it's people that then have to be mobilized to go in to try to help out and restore the infrastructure. So this can have really wide-reaching, um, dynamic implications. Another a couple of examples are both found in citrus fruits, and these are the citrus canker and the citrus greening disease. Uh, and the canker is a bacterial disease that can enter through a plant's stomata, which are the little kind of pores that they open in order to breathe, if you like, and also through wounds on the plant. So if you were listening a couple of weeks ago, you might have remembered uh, I talked about a current event. Well, so one of the kind of science in the news items that I talk about every now and then about this disease that's been problematic in the states where they've got the corn that's being really uh, affected. And right now we're in kind of a low, but there have been serious uh, what break, breakouts of these things over the last few years. And that's because you have these weather patterns that can have um, there's really damaging effects on the plants and so they opened up wounds when there's a lot of hail or strong wind or strong rains and then the pathogens invade through those wounds. Well that's exactly what's happening here with the citrus canker. And sometimes you have the weather creating those wounds but also you can have the citrus leaf miner going along, nibbling away and then allowing the pathogens to get in that way. And so this manifests as lesions on the leaves and on the stem and on the fruit and then eventually those lesions will start to spread to other plants because uh, you particularly during storms you'll have these events that allow the pathogens to hop from one to the next and also when you've got a storm not only can you have the wind blowing these things away or the the rain dripping them from one location to the next but you also can have um, you know these plants touching each other and you can have things being harmed physically by the, the wind as I just said and by the rain and that can again allow these pathogens to invade the plant. So you've got kind of a, a two-pronged attack there where these poor plants are being hurt by the environment and by the species in that environment. With the greening, what we have are bacteria that are being spread by citrus psyllids and these psyllids are also known as jumping plant lice and they feed on the sap of plants and so they'll nibble into the plants and then introduce these pathogens. And this can cause the yellowing of veins and tissues and leaves. Eventually you have defoliation and twig death. And then you have overall sickness and death of the whole plant. So it's a step-by-step -step process where the plant just gets progressively sicker. And there's no control for the disease. And re research has proved really difficult because it's hard to replicate conditions in a laboratory setting. And what's really scary is that no naturally immune individuals have been found just yet. So that makes it really hard for researchers to try to genetically modify plants by taking that gene that has worked in the past and then kind of introducing it and breeding it into other plants in order to have a new strain that growers might be able to use out in their fields. So right now we don't have something that kind of um, act as an insurance policy basically. So the citrus industry is really on high alert about this and they're quarantining things and they're cutting down whole groves and they're burning whole groves and they're really trying hard to stem this because a lot of people are worried that this could completely decimate the citrus industry. So now the last category of plant pathogens that I want to address is the sort of stuff that occurs in wild plants. And unfortunately, we actually don't know as much about this as we should. And that's because usually the EIDs that are studied in wild plants are those that we, we know of because they've hopped into agricultural plants and so we care about them for economic reasons or we're worried about the other, so we know that they occur in agricultural plants, and so we're trying to see if maybe natural plants might be kind of a, a reservoir where those things could, could hide out in order to, we might be able to get rid of it in one cornfield, but then it's hiding out in natural plants, and then might hop back into the corn the next time you plant something. And every now and then we kind of know something about a, a wild plant pathogen for its own sake, but usually it is tied into some sort of an economic Thing. So for example, if you've got trees that are really important for lumber or for engineering an ecosystem in which you do something else, that's when we start to pay attention. So we do only have a few really good, well-studied examples of things. And one of these is the chestnut blight. So this was caused by a fungus that's native to Asia, but then was introduced into North America. 
And the Japanese trees that were originally um, exposed to this have all developed resistance, but the American trees hadn't. And so whenever this thing was introduced, the American trees were absolutely decimated within about 50 years. And basically, the American chestnut is now extinct. And what's quite sad about this is that this is mainly a bark disease, so it doesn't infect the roots, which means that the plants can actually keep growing. So they'll have these little bits under the soil that'll keep pushing up these little shoots, and it's trying to grow, and it's trying to grow, but then it gets to a certain size, and the blight kicks in, and that means that these things will die off, try a new shoot, die off, and then keep going and keep going. And then after maybe a couple of decades, that will finally stop, and the plant just gives it up. And the reason that this happens is that um, you've got these things that are, um, you know, the, the genes are all telling it that it's all right, but then as soon as, as soon as it gets to a certain point, the other genes kick in, the fungus starts growing, it starts doing really well and choking off all of the supply of, of food and of energy, and so the things will die out all over again. And this is quite problematic because chestnuts were quite important economically. They were logged for furniture, they were logged for uh, enormous boards that could be used for homes. I mean, these trees were really massive. And they also were hugely important in shaping the entire ecosystem. And in fact, these trees were so big, and there were so many of them, that there are remnants that you can still find of, of old wood that fell down a really long time ago, and now these giant trunks and limbs are kind of lying in awkward places where they are doing kind of harm to the ecosystem. So for example, we've got some that have fallen across streams and have kind of dammed them up and stopped the stream from flowing quite as well as it should. And so this is something that, you know, even though that wood is probably being used by insects that might be a home to certain animals, that should have been living wood, and now we have forests that are filled with this dead detritus, and so we need to do something with it. And of course, that's quite an expensive process, and um, you know, it's very unlikely that anyone's going to take that on. Another really good example is Dutch elm disease, which we've all probably heard of. And there were two major pandemics of this that occurred during the 20th century. And these were problematic um, in North America, in Europe, and also in Southwest Asia. And these um, disease what pandemics were caused by the fact that we had infected timber that was um, containing these wilt funguses and it was moved to new areas and so that exposed things to different strains um, and to strains they hadn't seen before ever or strains that were different than the ones that had been exposed to before and so all of these things were attacking all of the native trees and they're able to invade the trees because there are these elm bark beetles that can kind of nibble on the tree and create this opening through which the pathogen can, can lurk. And actually the pathogens can get in on their own as well, but the beetles can certainly make this a much easier and faster process. And what's really sad here is that the trees are responding to the infection. They, they feel the infection, they recognize it, and so they block up their own xylem tissue in order to make sure that these things can't keep invading up through their tissues. But when they do this, they're cutting off their own supply of water and nutrients. And so the tree is basically dying because of its own good immunological reaction, which is really depressing. It's, I mean, it's both the elm trees and the chestnut trees. It's quite a sad thing because you see the trees trying to do what evolution has taught them they should do in order to keep surviving. But these pathogens have really gone in there and they've just, they've won the battle. They've won the kind of arms race between pathogen and host. So the roots of these things are the last to die, just like in the chestnut example. And these trees can can hang on for quite a long time and, and keep pushing up suckers and they last for about 15 years before they finally succumb. But actually, some of these, if you'll notice in Britain there are some spots where there are some of these trees still growing and they're kind of in like a, a hedge type shape and that's because if you keep them trimmed quite low then having this lack of flow isn't such a big deal because you're still able to get enough stuff up to the top enough nutrients, enough water to keep the plant alive even though there is some blockage. So there are some bits where there are these really abnormally shaped short little elms. And places like Brighton and Edinburgh also have quite high concentrations because they've isolated their elms and they've really quickly responded to infestations and so they've been able to keep some of these trees alive. And there are places now where you can go and see that they uh, inoculate the trees in order to try to keep them nice and safe, kind of the way we might get a flu jab. So actually, on both of my college campuses, when I was an undergrad and a, uh, a master's and a PhD student, 
those two schools had a few elms that were lingering because they had really good arborists that kind of kept these things protected for a while. And they would go and periodically inject the trees with um, some sort of vaccine, basically, to keep them most likely immune. Now, of course, you always know that a pathogen can evolve and can change so that it's able to target these things, but the vaccines have been quite successful over the last several decades. So there are little tricks like this that we have to try to save these trees, um, even when these pathogens are out there. So there are also some other newer examples than these things. So obviously both of those things happened quite a long time ago, the chestnut blight and the Dutch elm disease. But there are newer examples of things that have kind of been emerging more recently. So things like a slime mold that has been attacking eelgrass, um, a fungus that has been isolated attacking uh, an endangered pondberry species, and also a rust that has been found to attack uh, kind of a really localized endemic species known as the Humboldt Bay wallflower. So there are lots of these kind of emerging diseases in wild plants that we just are just now beginning to isolate and figure out what are these things, what are they doing, and how can we maybe try to stop this. Welcome back to The Wild Side. That was Julie and Buddy Miller with Wallflower. And now that I've kind of run through some examples of plant pathogens, I want to think a little bit about why we have these plant pathogens emerging to begin with. And there are lots of different factors that contribute to um, the appearance of these things on our radar. And one of them is something that scientists have begun to refer to as pathogen pollution. And basically this is, um, this happens because we've got anthropogenic movement of pathogens and parasites outside of their natural ranges. And of course humans are helping these things to cross evolutionary boundaries. So we're moving them across geographical um, divides, we're moving them across ecological divides, and so we're helping them reach new host species. Or I guess you could turn that on its head and think we're also moving host species into areas where there weren't previously these things that the pathogens could attack. And so we're moving both of these around and helping them to, to meet up with each other. And so we get this, this effect where you've got pathogens that are um, changing or getting rid of biodiversity in certain areas. And all of that is mediated by this human activity. So it's another kind of anthropogenic thing, and it just happens to be pathogens that we're doing damage via, rather than things like trash or noise pollution or things like that. And a lot of this is thanks to the fact that we have a really thriving and global trade. And it's not just people, you know, individuals traveling from one place to another, but it's these massive shipments of things, and particularly biological things, and things related to the plants themselves. So crops are producing large shipments that we move to a new location, or we're making things out of food, or uh, out of food, out of wood, or out of plants, and we're moving those to new locations. And all of these different methods can help pathogens that are embedded in those products get to new areas. There are also things that I've talked about in the past on the show, like changes in farming techniques that can facilitate the spread of disease. So you've got people in one country hearing about what people are doing elsewhere and then trying that technique out. And that might be really great for increasing yield of the crop, but it can also mean that you change what you're doing and so suddenly you make the environment uh, more accessible or better for a pathogen. Sometimes we might even find that these pathogens have been introduced somewhere and then they just kind of lie and wait for the right conditions to emerge. And then as soon as maybe a vector is introduced and that facilitates infection, suddenly this thing becomes a huge problem. So that was what happened with uh, citrus disease that uh, was really problematic in Brazil, for example. So the disease was actually there. It had been introduced quite a while earlier. And then all of a sudden, these aphids were also introduced and the disease was able to capitalize on the behavior of the aphids and then get into the citrus trees and cause the death of hundreds of millions of, of these citrus trees and that obviously had huge economic implications. Another really important factor is climate change. Uh, so we know that climate change is related to the emergence of diseases in humans and wildlife for various reasons, um, you know, for movement of things to new locations because of new conditions and the environment kind of facilitating the growth and the transport of these things. But we don't know quite as much about plants. Uh, we do know that the changing environments do alter distribution, so things that need cold kind of have to move up to the north where it's still cold, or things that don't like really hot weather might kind of also move to 
to make sure that it's a bit cooler where they are. So all these things are kind of shuffling around geographically. And when they do that, they might take their pathogens with them, or they might encounter pathogens that they hadn't found before, or the pathogens themselves might kind of be able to piggyback. And so we have this problem with uh, the, the new climate system that we've got, basically creating from scratch these new environments where, where new pathogens and new hosts are meeting each other. And unusual weather events are also on the rise because of climate change, and this also can help spread disease. So we have this physical damage that I mentioned earlier. You have kind of, maybe if you've got a, a big hurricane that blows through, it knocks a bunch of trees down, and suddenly the habitat is no longer a forested thing, it's kind of a grassland thing, and that facilitates the growth and the movement of new types of plants or pathogens. And so it can be a, kind of an ecosystem-wide ecological thing as well, and not just the movement of these things to new places. You might also find that where we've got milder winters, the pathogens are able to survive the winter months when they might ordinarily have died out. And so this helps them reinfect certain areas where they would have just kind of vanished from after a while in the past. And this is clearly an area that needs a lot more research because we all know that climate change is here, it's ongoing, and so it's going to have implications and repercussions that continue in the future and may even ramp up uh, depending on kind of what we do with our carbon consumption and, uh, you know, whatever is happening in the climate. Another big problem is agricultural change. So we have a lot of intensification, diversification, globalization, and all of these things are increasing the import of non-native species, they're exposing plants to these novel pathogens. Uh, we tend to focus on particular cultivars and so we don't have this diversity of genetic variants that we used to have. So now you might lose the characteristics that would naturally exist in a population of growing plants that can be capitalized on in order to have kind of natural resistance to things. So maybe we've got more and more crops that have no way of dealing with these pathogens once they're introduced. And this can actually be so problematic that you might not have any of that variation left at all. And this is why people are really interested in seed banks, in places where you can have all these variants and, and natural relatives of these things, wild growing relatives, because whenever these new pathogens do cause problems, we can go back to those original strains and look at the variation that we've got in our little libraries of seeds and see if there is something there that we can use and we can kind of breed that back into the crops. Another big driver of the emergence is host pathogen evolution, and I've already kind of referred to this a little bit today, and that's related to the fact that you've got this natural arms race between hosts and pathogens. And when pathogens get one step ahead, or when hosts fall one step behind because something happens in the DNA of these things and, and with the genes that these things have, then suddenly the diseases might appear to be much more prominent. So they might have been there all along, but they were held in check and then suddenly that check is removed and these things can go rampant. And this can actually be traced back to changes in just a single gene. So it might not really be all that uncommon that this happens because it doesn't take much for one or the other of these types of, of organisms, the, the pathogen or the host, to gain the upper hand. There can also be uh, hybridization events that allow multiple pathogens to intermingle their genes. And I think this is one of the scariest things, certainly that, that I read about when I think um, of not just pathogens, but kind of all bacteria and other things that are kind of able to, to intermingle their genes a bit more easily than animals can and, and than plants can. Because you've got these things that come into contact with each other, particularly because of human behavior and kind of the environments that we create. And they kind of, a lot of these things can just spit their genes out into the environment, and then other things can come along and suck them back up and incorporate those into their genomes, and suddenly you can have these superbugs that have lots of, of really bad characteristics, lots of resistance, and so it's really hard to tackle these things. And I've talked about this before on the show, particularly with respect to kind of um, human infection and what do we do about these superbugs that we can't treat with any antibiotics because they're resistant to all of them. So we can see similar things happening in plant pathogens, actually. And so they become very powerful, they become very resistant, and it can be quite difficult to treat these things because we don't really have the means, uh, and so what do we do when our crops are being attacked by these really powerful um, kind of bad guy pathogens? And again, um, this is a really interesting thing because we know, this, we know this happens in plant pathogens, and we haven't seen much of this kind of hybridization thing happening in, in quite the same way in humans or in animals. So 
what we see in humans and animals are where you've got strains that kind of co-occur, we do see that exchange of, of DNA. What's really quite unique in the plant world is that you've got strains that don't live together that somehow still manage to share their DNA in some way. And this is quite a weird process because we don't quite understand how is that genetic information moving. Is it just kind of sitting in the plant and so then the next pathogen can come in and, and extract it from the plant in some way uh, because it's sitting in the plant's genome? Who knows? Is it just blowing in because of the weather? Because there are some things where the wind and the rain can blow these organisms to new places. So it's kind of this strange thing that happens where these organisms aren't living together and yet can kind of intermingle their genes and, and create these new pathogens that are very powerful. And we don't think that we see that in humans or animals, but maybe it does happen and we just don't know it quite well enough. We just haven't documented this yet. And this clearly is something that we need to study because this is the thing that creates these really powerful, scary pathogens that we probably need to be targeting the most because they can do the most damage. Welcome back to The Wild Side. That was Casey Chambers and Shane Nicholson with Sick as a Dog. And today I'm talking about emerging infectious diseases in plants. And I've already kind of throughout the show as I've been talking about some of these examples indicated what the impacts were of these things. But now I just want to go a little bit more into detail about some of those. So what's really amazing I think about the fact that we've got all these diseases affecting plants is that it doesn't just affect the plants, but it also affects us. And of course, we're going to pay particular attention to these things because we do care about ourselves. But it is quite amazing to just look at the broad array of effects that these things can have and the really far-reaching implications it can have for human society as a whole. So for example, a lot of these pathogens can affect nearly half of all crops. So when they invade, they really invade and do a lot of damage. And this results in losses of you know, hundreds of billions of dollars per year. So clearly this is an issue that you know, the industry needs to address in terms of coming up with good practices, coming up with better strains that are more resistant, even if you don't mind the use of chemicals, coming up with treatments that we can use to get rid of these things. But the other step after that is that you know, when these diseases do appear, they can cause famine, as I mentioned for the case of Uganda. They can cause people to abandon agriculture altogether and relocate to new areas. And when they do that, if they're moving into forested areas, they might chop down trees in order to make space to live, or they might chop down the trees to build a house, and so that can change the whole ecosystem. When you move into new habitats, you can take strains of illness from humans with you and expose people there, or when you go, you can be exposed to the illnesses that are already in place. Um, and of course, those are the obvious things that we see because they kind of happen. The other thing is the stuff that doesn't happen, the stuff that we don't know. So for example, when we lose biodiversity because of all of these diseases, whether we're talking about agricultural biodiversity or the biodiversity of wild plants that are out there being affected by pathogens as well, that means that we're losing potential pharmaceuticals, we're losing potential crops, we're losing those genes that are resistant uh, to, to the diseases, we're losing rare and endemic species. So there is a heavy price to pay for these pathogens as well uh, for the plants and for our future of what we could have done with those plants. And of course, biodiversity is, is important because it can have a big impact on ecosystem function and ecosystem stability. And so when you've got diseases jumping from one type of species to the next, uh, whether it's from agricultural stuff to wild species or vice versa, or from or within each of those categories, then you can have a significant effect on kind of the habitat in general and certain species that would have been really important maybe for insects that lived on them or animals that live within them or for other plants that were, you know, they live under the canopy of a certain tree. So there are these knock-on effects of the other species as well throughout the whole ecosystem. And this is particularly going to be an important thing when, we're t when we are talking about large plants that kind of help construct the whole ecosystem. So of course every species is important. Every species will be tied to other species because of the food web. But these large plants like the chestnut, as I talked about earlier, that kind of construct a whole big space where hundreds and hundreds of species are living, those are going to be particularly problematic if you lose those to pathogens. So what do we do about the threat of all this stuff? You know, what, how are we going to move forward given that this is a problem out there? Well, of course we want to increase 
our inspections and our quarantine efforts and our other safety mechanisms that we've come up with to try to reduce the flow of infection. And this is particularly something that we can address in terms of agricultural plants because we do already have these systems in place to check them and now we can just be more rigorous and check different sorts of things. We also need to understand our basic understanding of the underlying pathogen biology and of the evolutionary interactions and the balances between these things, the anthropogenic influences on all these processes, and also the environmental effects. So that's, that's a lot of stuff I know that we need to improve our knowledge on. But we do clearly need to think about pathogens not just in humans and animals, but also in plants. And we need to think beyond just the agricultural plants. We need to think about all these different species and how they kind of interact with each other and how they interact in these new landscapes that we've kind of engineered for human purposes. So farmland, uh, you know, cityscapes where we've put in parks and when we have nice ornamental trees, things in our gardens. So all of this stuff that we're doing is affecting whether or not pathogens are around and how they spread from one place to another and what organisms are there for them to spread into. So we need to uh, think about all of these things and how they kind of fit together. And we need to also wonder about the, the spatial scale and the time frame over which diseases are likely to spread and the conditions under which they're likely to spread so that we can you know, kind of put some controls into place, hopefully beforehand, so we can stop stuff from happening rather than trying to treat it after the fact, because treating it after the fact is going to be much harder and probably also much more expensive. So the main message, I guess, of today's show uh, is not to panic you, actually, because th there are a lot of things out there, but we do also have a lot of, of controls in place. We are working towards fixing a lot of these issues, so it's not like we're at uh, you know, extreme scare mode just yet. But this is something that has conservation implications, it has economic and health implications, and so it is good to have on the radar. Uh, we ourselves can actually contribute to, to minimizing the movement of disease, and that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this on the show, because we can do things like, you know, we don't climb trees anymore, because if you climb a tree you can damage it, or if you've climbed a couple of trees you might move little bits of, of one into the next one and introduce a disease. If we are going to interact with plants, especially trees, we shouldn't break off twigs or pluck things up out of the ground. We shouldn't transport things when we travel. So if we're just kind of careful about what we do while we're out there, then we can make sure that we aren't the agents of moving those pathogens from one place to another. And another really nice thing is that if you see infected individuals, and this is particularly something that you're likely to notice with trees, we can log into the internet and we can report these things and local officials can go in and they can treat the plants, they can quarantine them, they can remove them, and so they can stop the spread of disease as soon as possible. And um, actually, one of the reasons I wanted to look into this issue was that we have recently been having an effort on the University of Exeter campus to control a Phytophthora infestation. And there, been, there have been lots of these infestations around Britain, and particularly in Cornwall, where we do have lots of ornamental plants. And people have found that if you act very quickly, if you pay attention, if you go in and, and take care of the plants immediately, you can preserve uh, the remainder and keep the disease from spreading. You can keep all the plants from becoming ill. And so if we do pay attention, and we act fast, and we make sure that people aren't kind of interfering, then we can preserve a lot of these things and keep them safe. And so it's just nice to know that if you keep your eyes open, and if you're nice and careful, you can be kind of a mechanism for helping plants out and keeping uh, too many pathogens from spreading around. So on that kind of positive note, I will end for the day with Plant White Roses by Kelly Logan. And I will talk to you next week.